Alright, so for our penultimate original versus remake video for this season, I wanted to go into uh, Goodnight Mommy, which is, of course, uh, I think it's an Austrian movie. And it had, a, I think it hit the festivals around 2014 and then kind of had a release like in 2015. And it kind of really took off and got this really big reputation, especially amongst horror fans. So naturally, it was going to get the American remake treatment at some point. And it's, it's really funny because I do remember hearing the news that Naomi Watts was going to star in a Goodnight Mommy remake. And then I kind of just forgot about its existence. And when I went to look it up to watch it, um, the year I searched was like 2019. Because I was under the impression it was like kind of a few years back. And uh, no, it was last year. And it just kind of came and went without me even really realizing it. So... Um, so, as far as that goes, though, as far as the remake goes, and the intentions behind it, um, it is interesting when you read up that the director didn't necessarily approach it with that idea of, oh, it's, you know, this foreign horror movie that took off, so we have to remake it as an American movie. Because apparently, he turned it down. Like, he, like he really, really turned it down. Because it was just going to be kind of a remake. But then I guess he and the writer got together and they got kind of this idea of taking it and it's like still keeping like you know the core sort of plot details but then taking it in kind of their own thematic direction and then it kind of started to change as it went and I guess we'll take it that's commendable so I guess we'll take a look at it in detail and see if that paid off or not um, so to talk about the original movie there is something about this mother figure right away, if you want to talk about the differences between the two movies. Um, the, the, probably the most significant difference between the two movies. Where, when we meet her, she just immediately has this startling appearance. And it's and especially when you have it in your mind that, you know, it's a maternal figure, and this is somebody that's been in their life, and we get, we get to the impression that what we're seeing now was not in any way what she was before. There was something very tender about their relationship before, and now just this full-on... She immediately feels like kind of a horror movie character in general, and it's very easy very quickly to buy. Oh, this this may not be... Like, this may not just be the imagination of children. Um, this is, seems like a very dark and sinister person lurking behind those bandages. And, it, and it's kind of genuinely scary, like, the first time we meet her, which is really impressive. Um, like, we don't really get a hint of it ourselves until they're listening to, like, the recording of her voice. And then we're like, you know, even though we never met the character at that particular time, it's like, oh yeah, there's definitely something off. Like, if it, it's, it wouldn't be surprising at all if this is not the same person at all, but some monster that's replaced her. Um, but we even get these sort of quieter moments, like, when they're playing the game where they're putting things on their head and they have to guess. And it's like, and not only does it work, you know, symbolically, because she literally can't figure out who she is, um, but it just shows the sort of coldness that happens here. It's not just the intimidation factor and the scary factor, but just the complete and total lack of emotion um, is something that can be just as startling when it's coming from what was initially a tender relationship. And so... In that idea, it is very interesting that we, and coincidental, that we just, um, the, the original versus remake we did before this was Invasion of the Body Snatchers, where we talked about the idea of knowing, like, the ins and outs of a person, and, like, knowing that person intimately, and it being, like, a loved one, and then them just not being that person suddenly, and how terrifying that concept is, and how we're kind of playing with that again, um... And so that's a really, this whole setup is a really effective way to use that. It's also kind of got vibes of the others at the beginning when you think about, you know, the strict rules that she has for the children and the not keeping, not letting sunlight in and stuff like that. Um, and there's just, in general, just something really off and unnerving about everything here. Um, as far as when Naomi Watts walks into the remake, Naomi Watts, who by the way I love and I cannot say enough great things about, in general, um, I guess I can just say up front here, I feel like there's a, a miscasting thing going on here. I feel like that's kind of the main bump that the remake hit, uh, was um, I don't know about Naomi Watts as a casting choice when you look at how this, how the character plays out and how this performance plays out, where 
she just kind of walks into the room. There's no, it's very unceremoniously, and her, her bandages don't look near as grotesque, um, so it's not near as, like, instantly off-putting the way it was uh, with the original character. Um, but it seemed like one of the changes they wanted to make was that the tenderness is still lurking in here. Maybe to give the audience a bit more of a, oh, it, is she or is she not, it can, where it feels more back and forth rather than just the sort of constant intimidation and coldness that the uh, character in the original has. It's a good idea on paper, but um, when you see, like I said, how this plays out, and she's very apologetic, she says stuff like, you know, it's still me under here, and she's just very soft-spoken. Um, it's, I, I don't know if that works in the same way, especially with the line where she says, I'm still me under here, because that does feel like it's kind of the movie jumping ahead of itself, because... Regardless of what the outcome of this story was, I feel like that line is jumping the gun a little bit. Where it's like, you know, the fact that it, it is really her, and it's like, it's basically just saying like, oh no, don't worry, it is still me. Like, she's just basically saying what's happening. But if it was the other way around, and there was some factor in here of she's not who she says she is, or she's a different person, or a different being altogether... Um, it feels like it's laying it on thick with the misdirection of, oh no, I'm still me because I say I am. Um, so just either, regardless of what the outcome was, that line was misplaced. That line should probably not be here, because <laughs> um, it doesn't work in any context. But I think another problem it has as far as Naomi Watts being cast is that I, I am not familiar with the actress in the original movie at all. Um, and I'm extremely aware of Naomi Watts, so it's like, there's this constant mystery factor and this unnerving factor to, I don't know what's under the bandages when I watch the original movie before they come off. And so there's the whole idea of, you know, like, what is under there and is there anything? And the way they, they keep it under wraps about what the mom actually looks like for a long time, where... We see pictures, but all the pictures we see of her are, like, distant or out of focus, or they get kind of shrouded in darkness, or she's wearing sunglasses, and you never get a really good look at her in the pictures. And so, when we're not really sure what to expect as far as if we're, whatever we're going to see is her or not. There's this mystery factor surrounding that for a long time. Um, there's also the moment when she, they have the dream where she's in the woods, and it's like, just as the camera's coming around, she turns her head, and then her head does, like, the Jacob's Ladder thing. Um, that's, all of this is stuff that, like, really amps up this mystery, but also just the tension and the scare factor in general of the unknown, despite the fact that this is somebody you should know better than you know anybody else, and you should feel protected by this person. And they could just be this potentially strange monster underneath. Um, now, as far as the Naomi Watts version of all this, when I was talking about not having clear shots of her in the pictures and that amping up the mystery factor, when they play this scene in the remake, it's just a blatant headshot of Naomi Watts. She's playing an actress, so they, they play into that. I don't know what the purpose of that was, but... Um, yeah, giving her this whole... There's no mystery to what she actually looks like. Because not even if it wasn't just a giant headshot of Naomi Watts, we're all very familiar with what Naomi Watts looks like. And so there's no mystery factor behind that. And that that's a whole layer of the scariness in the original movie. And that's just gone with the casting of a very recognizable actress. Um, but there's also this thing about the dreams where the dreams come into the remake really late and there's the like there's the whole thing with um her the skin on her toenail which very much feels like you know the the hallucination in black swan and then when she like tears off the skin is very like the end of under the skin so all of that just looks like territory we've already been in but if you want to talk about the concept itself um where it is a dream of her being a monster and and the idea of you know fear of adults by children being, like, you know, visualized as monsters. It's something we've seen in movies before, like like Celia, the Australian movie, or um, the David Alan Greer segment of Tales from the Hood. And those are really good, at, um, like, examples of being able to do that, like, do the monster thing sort of symbolically and show a childhood fear of an adult. Um, 
what's great about the original movie is that the original movie doesn't need to actually portray her on screen as a monster in a dream sequence. All of the fear and all of the, is this person a monster, just comes from her real behavior outside of the dreams. Because, um, I mean, we do get, you know, the dream scene, like the Jacob's Ladder-esque scene and the scene where, like, the bug goes in her mouth and stuff like that. But it's not near as blatant as just literally portraying her as a monster the way um, the dreams in the remake do. And I feel like it definitely establishes that point in a more abstract way by the way the original movie does it, which makes it more satisfying to watch it play out, where it's like the remake might as well be screaming in your face. They think she might be a monster, like me metaphorically and literally, and so that's uh, that's that's a lot. But it's it's also like pre that kind of thing that's just predictable with a foreign movie getting Amer getting an American remake, where it's like you kind of just expect going in that it's gonna be the same movie, just the American version is gonna be everything very much spelled out, um, and that's that that is a big factor in the remake also. But um, if you want to talk about the way we continue to go in the direction of she's getting more sinister and unnerving as it goes on, and it's like not knowing for sure if this is their actual mother or not, and the way they amp up the scares, another way they obscure her face before we really see it is this great scene in the original movie when she's in the mirror and she's got her back to the door, and one of the kids is there, Elias, I'm assuming, um, and she turns and we just see her eye, the reflection of her eye in the mirror, and of course because of the angle it's like big in this moment. And I especially like that moment because it's what a, it's not really a jump scare, it's what I call a flinch scare, where, where a jump scare is typically you're startled by a loud noise and that's just a a physical reaction that you can't help, so the movie's not really doing anything, and then taking credit for it. Um, whereas a flinch scare is more like something that makes you physically react like that, but it's to something that you're seeing, um, and that and that in general, like something actually startling within you, um, and now that's actually something where the filmmakers needed to put effort into it. Um, that being said, I was surprised that, um, unless there's, like, one I'm forgetting, I don't remember any attempts at jump scares in the remake, which is really surprising. So, I'm glad they avoided that, and I think that also kind of goes into them wanting to make a more, sort of, a particular thematic kind of, like, going in a particular direction as far as the themes, and it not being, like, a full-on horror movie. Like, this one, the original's much more of a horror movie than the remake is, and that seems to be intentional, but maybe that's also a problem, especially if you're a horror fan, because in the, in the remake, they do start to show their hand, like, really early, where we have, like, the moment where she's on the phone and she says, I'm tired of pretending, and it's like, yeah, it's the, she's pretending that Lucas is still alive, and but we're supposed to think, oh, I'm tired of pretending they're mother, there is something there, but once again, that happens way early. And it's like, to already set up that there is something afoot that early is... It feels like it lacks confidence, I guess you could say, because the original movie has a really sort of deliberate pace as it goes. And it's a long time, it feels like, before there's something really explicit like that to make us think, okay, so there's definitely something off. It's not just childhood fears getting exaggerated, which is what I think we're supposed to feel for at least the first half, um, and debate that with ourselves of, is it that or is it something else? Um, the the remake's in a big damn hurry <laughs> um, to make us start saying, like, oh, there's definitely something wrong, but what is it? Um, and with the way also it fails to like build up and just make the character feel intimidating just in her behavior like her mundane behavior even um we have to get to big moments like when naomi watts's character essentially jack torrance's through a door at one point she's even doing the going back and forth between screaming open the fucking door and terms of endearment uh and like the ch the tones changing and stuff like that and but that's just it, it's just so um, 
what's the word, like, it's, it's so scripted, it's so planned that we're supposed to say, oh, it's scary because she's screaming, but then she's soft-spoken, but then she's screaming again. Um, and it's like just watching the character. The character doesn't have to really say anything or do anything particularly drastic in the original movie. You just watch her and you get those vibes of, I don't... You you actually only even want to look at her for so long before it's just uncomfortable to even... for for Just even the sight of her is uncomfortable. And that's built up through the behavior and the way she interacts with the kids in like the first act. Um, and it's, and it's like instantaneous that we feel that way. And that's just, they really had to do what they could to make Naomi Watts seem like some kind of threat. And it, there's never really an instance where it comes through like really potently the way it did, it does from beginning to basically end of the original movie. Um, because there's also a moment when you talk about the characters actually being scary. Um, and the and the way this situations and the scenes are that are supposed to evoke that, there's the moment when like okay there's a moment in the remake when Elias is pretending to sleep and she comes into the room and she walks like all the way up to him and then she like adjusts his blanket and then she leaves and then he finally gets to breathe. That's supposed to be, like, this really, really, really suspenseful moment. Um, but like I said, the character is just never scary enough, or, in, like, suspicious enough, even, for us to feel that on, like, a really deep level the way we do in a very early scene, once again, in the original movie, where it's right after the mirror uh, scare, I think when she senses that a child is out of bed, so she comes into the bedroom, and she opens the door and looks in the room, and Elias is standing right there against the wall next to the door, just barely out of her line of vision. And it holds on this for a long time, and she, like, starts to walk in a little bit, and it's, like, just any second. She's, like, just one small turn away from seeing him, and it looks like at one moment her head's gonna actually turn that way, but then she's just kind of stepping in a little further. That is the... That's the... You have to... You have to breathe... You have to basically pause the movie to start breathing again <laughs> after that moment, and that's just something you're not gonna get uh, in these scenes from the remake, and that's... That's going to be something that, there, that's a bump that it has a hard time getting over the whole time and it never really gets there. Because um, even when you look at, like, the the cruelty, there's one moment when I feel like we actually reach a peak of the cruelty we can get from Naomi Watts' version. And that's uh, these these different ways where the mother shuns Lucas uh, for reasons that we know. But, um... At the time, they seem kind of cruel and dismissive if you don't know uh, what the sort of final development of the movie is. And so there are these moments when, like the moment when he says, um, me and Lucas got you, like the, I think they're like shells or something. And she's al it's already been made apparent that she's shunning Lucas at this point. She didn't make him breakfast. She didn't give him a drink. And so there's this moment where he's holding out two shells and says, these are from me and Lucas. And she only takes one of them. And it's and it's just this moment where you just sense the the cruelty factor to it if you don't know what's going on. Even even if you do know what's going on, there's still something there, um, as far as the character just feeling very cold and emotionless and like deliberately making a choice that's emotionally cold and distant, um, and and could be potentially cruel. Um, as far as any moment like that, the one thing that I feel like kind of works in this, in the remake, is the, ter the him finding the drawing in the trash can, and then subsequently watching her tear it up when she doesn't know that he's watching. And that's like the most cruel in the moment. Even if you know what's going on, still, there's just this mo uh, I think it's knowing Elias' heartbreak watching this happen. Um, where it actually feels like the character is really coming through as, you know, cold and cruel and all that, in the way that she's supposed to be. And 
with all the other things that are going on here, that's... We needed more. Uh, we we needed more than that um, for this Naomi Watts version of the character to really feel like uh, this, like the figure is in the original movie, and also just in general the portrayal of the kids, where uh, Elias and Lucas in the original movie are a lot quieter, and you get you get this sense that they've been through trauma, but there's still a mystery surrounding what that might have been. Um, the kids in the remake are pretty rowdy and pretty talkative, and it's it's definitely a different vibe going on, but I guess that almost seems like an intentional change, because it's like, you know, people, especially kids, will grieve in different ways or go through trauma in different ways or whatever. Um, but it feels much more affecting when they're quiet and you just kind of sense the trauma without the movie having to tell you explicitly that something happened. And so, and that's, that, I mean, that sums up the whole thing, basically, of, uh, the remake basically here to essentially spell everything out. The, basically, the original, the remake is here to be the Wikipedia synopsis of the original movie. It's basically what its purpose serves. Um, because there's the moment, like, when we're talking about spelling things out, there's the moment in the original movie, it's a couple of moments, when she's like disrobing and looking at herself in the mirror. And when you're watching this scene in the original movie, there's something mysterious about it. Like it's not, we're not entirely clear what's going on or what she's doing because the behavior up to this point has been so bizarre. It could honestly just be that, just bizarre behavior. Um, but then we can also get the vibe of, well maybe th this is her like kind of wanting to feel desirable again or whatever. So you and you can have that thought on your own. So when we see these shots of her disrobing and just looking at herself in the mirror, it's like she wants to be desirable again or whatever. She's taking herself back to a place. Um, that's not enough for the remake. Uh, the remake wants to get this point across by having her do like a dancing striptease in the mirror. Um, not to mention with one of the kids watching. Um, so, unknowingly, but still, um, it's kind of a messed up detail, and that's just really, like I said, it, it basically takes the point of the original movie and just basically makes it as blatant and spelled out as possible, and that, and, and, and talking about that also, it's not just the points that they make, but it's, like, the scenes themselves and the way they play out, and what needs to be in our face and what doesn't. So... We have this moment where Elias confronts her after the cat's death. The cat that's not even in the remake. Um, and so after this, she finally breaks him down. She drags him into the other room, and she shuts the door. And we basically hear what is essentially a brainwashing or an attempted brainwashing in real time, where she's just, like, making him repeat, you know, I'm your mother, I'm your mother, and telling him that he can't talk to Lucas. And so, and to hear this, and to hear how just cruel and, like, kind of unimaginable it is as far as a mother's behavior, a mother that was apparently tender at one point, and we only hear it from the other side of the door, that's it. And so, once again, pretty predictably, like, if there was one change from original to remake that I had to guess and bet a lot of money on, it would be that in the remake, that scene is set on the other side of the door where we see all the action. And sure enough, yeah, she's got him in like the tub and she's spraying water in his face. Uh, there's big music notes on the score. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's everything you expect it to be as an American remake of a foreign movie. And so... And also, like, the different touches of um, bringing in other characters. Other characters that may, you know, figure out what's going on here and may possibly be able to help. Because um, this is after we've reached the... This is when we're reaching the turning point. We're, reading, we're reaching the catalyst to go into the insane fucking third act. So there's the moment when they run away, they get away, and then they find the priest, and the priest is saying he's going to take them to the police station, but he ends up bringing them back to her instead. And there's a, it's just like this nightmarish moment of no escape when he pulls back in and we realize where they are. 
Um, and then that's like kind of the last straw that sort of snaps them into what the last third of the movie is. And they do this with um, a pair of cops in the remake. And, it's, and it almost feels like there's another layer of cruelty there from the cops. Like, m almost more so than the Naomi Watts character, where it's like, um, she says, uh, yeah, it's okay, we're gonna take you somewhere safe, we're gonna take you somewhere with a bed. And they're tricking them into taking them back home. But the thing about it is that these, the introduction of the cops here is essentially to bring them back in the third act when the mother is tied up and she's trying to get help and because there's the moment where the cop seems to believe the kid over her and so we get the sense that these cops are going to come back into the story and that feels more of just like a standard thriller trope of uh, the character that kind of understands what's going on here but has to be secretive and then they'll come back in the third act um it just feels like a typical setup there and, and then they come back, and yeah, there's suspense to be had where they have to hide the fact that the mother's tied up and screaming from them. Um, originally, we played this way different with the Red Cross people, where it's actually, it's not just this moment of, like, very sort of fabricated suspense, but the suspense is absolutely there, but... It plays basically like a darkly funny scene when they like occupy the Red Cross people until they can get them away. But talking about the fact that they are hiding the mom and there's suspense here of if they can keep the mom hidden or not, or if they're going to get caught doing this, is this is what makes the sort of third act of Goodnight Mommy so insane. Is you watch like the whole movie and you're intimidated by the mother, you think there's definitely something wrong about her, It's it seems very unlikely that the kids are imagining something, and sh there's something monstrous about her, and something to be scared of, genuinely. And then, once we re the, reach this moment where they turn the tables on her, and they get her tied to the bed, and they torture her, it becomes very blurry surprisingly quickly because the movie has spent so long pretty much convincing us that the mother is not who she says she is. And so now that it's successfully convinced us of that, essentially it's the kids that turn into the dangerous threat. And now we're not sure of anything anymore. And the crazy thing about that also is that we... It, her persistence that she is their mother and nothing has changed the thing that makes her start to feel innocent as the climax goes on is the seemingly psychotic behavior of the kids like the crazier the kids start acting suddenly the less crazy she seems and the less scary she seems and the less guilty of something suspicious she seems and now it's like, it's all on the kids now. So it's like, when we get to that moment, when the Red Cross people show up or the cops show up, it's like, do we want her to be found or not? And that's a really cool feeling. <laughs> I love when movies can make us not know exactly what we want, but we know we're on the edge of our seat That's about something being revealed or something being found out. And, and we're not entirely sure what we want to have, what we want to be the case, what we want the outcome to be. That's really, really fun. And that's something, this whole sequence here, and really like most of the third act until we get to the emotional reveal, um, is what the third act of this movie is like. And, uh, and yeah, we are missing, like obviously we've got, you know, the, the super glue and the cutting her lips open and the magnifying glass burning her face and stuff like that. All of that has been taken out of the remake. And I can understand maybe not wanting to make like a torture movie or something like that, but still it's the sort of grotesquerie of what they're doing that takes us to that place where the it just feels so banal the the last third of the remake. Um, whereas in, like I said, it's what, it's the grotesquery of what they're doing and the extreme nature of what they're doing that makes us go, wait a minute, who the fuck am I rooting for? Um, and that's like the whole key factor of how you feel about the last third of this movie. And so to take all of that out, 
like I said, I get it if you don't want to make a torture movie or you feel like it's not necessary or it's excessive or whatever. But it's when you take it out of this particular story, you realize how crucial it was to how we were feeling about it and why sometimes that can be necessary for a story and it's not just gratuitous or for the sake of it. And so that's where that um, that's how I feel about that and the whole torture aspect of it. But then when it comes in and we realize the reveal and that Lucas has died in a car accident in the original movie and all of this behavior from the mother essentially comes from being uh, driven by grief. Once again, if it wasn't clear to you for some reason, um, the, remake will, the remake will help you out. The remake will aggressively grab your hand and pull you through it and tell you everything about what's going on here. I'm kind of surprised the remake didn't show, like, flashes of previous scenes to show how they're different now. Um, so props for restraint, I guess, as far as spelling everything out. But, um, yeah, so as far as, first of all, as far as the reveal itself, um, I will say this is where a debate comes in of um, how it can how effective is a movie still if its surprise reveal is pretty obvious from the get-go. Now, I don't know if I've just seen enough movies with twists that, like, the first time I saw it, like, as soon as she's acknowledging Elias and not Lucas, it's like, yeah, it does the clever thing where it kind of convinces you that she resents Lucas for some reason. Like, you could say, like, oh, maybe Lucas must be the reason she's covered in bandages and something happened. They even add in that line where Elias tells him, like, you know, you should apologize. Um, which is just sad when you have the full context. Um, but, yeah, but as far as setting that up, um, it does feel, like, obvious from the get-go if you've seen enough twists in movies where it's like, if there's one character that's not being acknowledged, there's a really good chance that character doesn't exist. <laughs> um, and you just sort of know that. There's especially, I think it doesn't help either that I actually just quite recently watched a movie um, with a very similar twist. I can't really, it's a similar setup, like of the whole movie and a similar twist, um, but I don't want to give that movie away, so I'll just say it's a movie from 1972. Um, that has a lot, that it feels like this movie kind of was greatly inspired by it feels like, and I, it's, just by complete coincidence, I had watched that movie recently, and so, as far as that goes, it's like, does it still have the impact, even if you can kind of see that particular moment, and yeah, certainly, yeah, because it's such an emotional path, like, it's not really necessarily about that, it's the emotion that comes with it once we know what everything was driven by, and what's been going on here this whole time, and that's what we kind of take away from it. Not necessarily, oh, there was a big twist. But, like, even if even if you want the surprise factor, like, like if you go into it and you're like, oh, I can kind of see that twist coming from a mile away, w the direction that it goes of them tying her to the bed and torturing her, surprise accomplished still, <laughs> regardless. <laughs> there was still a surprise element and an unexpected nature to this movie and an unpredictable nature to this movie anyway. Um, so, around what you, what you could call the twist. Um, so that, that's, that works regardless. Um, and yeah, they do change the events of the, in the remake, where it was, um, Elias who accidentally killed Lucas by accidentally shooting him in the barn. Um, and there's, I don't really, I mean, as far as changes go, Okay, so what the director of the remake has talked about is that um, he did want to make the changes he made thematically for the movie to kind of be specifically American in what it was dealing with, where he was talking about the idea of him looking around and how people, especially in America, feel the need to either be heroes or victims, and that's just the possibility cannot be on the table that they could be villains sometimes. And the idea of that, and like this refusal to believe um, that it's possible to have been the villain in a situation and not just a hero or a victim. And and also the fact that he wanted to tell it from like Elias's perspective, or feel like it was from Elias's perspective, uh, which kind of basically spells out the whole thing from the get-go. So, 
I can understand that, and I, I don't know if it's like a gun violence thing he was going for as far as changing the way Lucas died. Um, if I mean, that's also, with that being the case, unless I miss something, I've only seen the remake once, obviously, but um, I'm not sure why um, Naomi Watts' character is bandaged throughout the movie. I don't know if it's supposed to be like a cosmetic thing because she's an actress or what. Um, if so, that's kind of a lame go-around of your whole concept. Um, but, um, that, as far as that goes, I don't... It's not necessarily the changes to the story, because I can see what the point he wants to make, and there's nothing bad about it, and there's nothing bad about changing it up when you're remaking a movie, especially if you want to reimagine it, because that's the thing is... That's the thing about remakes in general, is you do the exact same thing and people get pissed off, you try to change it up a little bit, people get pissed off. Um, and so, to kind of try to bring a new idea to it, and a new outcome to it, to where, even if you've seen the original movie, it's not going to be completely predictable, there's, there's something to that, but there's just no engagement factor, is what the actual problem is. So, and it's like, that's something that stems from the beginning of the movie to the end of the movie. It's just a total lack of engagement for all the reasons we've talked about here. Um, and so when they're actually, because the, the original movie feels significantly more abrupt about its reveal and then how it just kind of ends almost like right after, but there's just enough there and there was enough build up in between and all the way up that the emotional factor is there. Um... And it's like, I mean, it could be a little stronger, like maybe just uh, not end like as abruptly as it does, but, you know, still, uh, still pretty close. It still gets to where it needs to go emotionally and thematically and everything, uh, just as it's uh, cutting to credits. So that's something, like I said, you're just, everything adding, everything not adding up was not going to help this payoff, this change. And it's like, it's not just inherently wrong because it's a change and because they went their own direction um like in many cases that could be encouraged but um n not just the fact that when you're talking about a movie that doesn't really need changes to it um but like I said, it's that lack of engagement that just really at the end of the day did not help the remake at all so and that, and i feel like even it because you could say you know is it is it because we're so familiar with the original like if we hadn't seen the original movie and the remake just stood alone, would it still have impact? And, uh, no, I, I don't think the, regardless, the engagement factor wouldn't be there, and that's what the death of the movie is, so. And just the general miscasting of Naomi Watts, which kills the engagement, so it all comes back to that, so. That's how I feel about these, so obviously, the original movie is significantly stronger, and there's, I wish I could say there's more merits in the remake, but I didn't really find much of any. So that, I, like I said, I felt like the, the use of the drawing is kind of the strongest aspect on an emotional level um, for the remake. But other than that, it's just, it's just kind of empty. And the, ki the kids are much easier to get involved in and just buy in general in the original. It's not like the kids in the remake are bad or anything, but... I said, there's just something, it's that sort of mysterious factor of the fact that they're quiet, and there's clearly something wrong, but we're not sure what, and it's basically up to us to just kind of watch them, and kind of piece it together for ourselves, um, and when the remake is just going to kind of tell us everything, that's, that satisfaction that the audience is going to get of getting investment and finding investment, it's just not going to be there, so that's, that's what's wrong with the remake, so... We've got one more uh, original versus remake thing that's going to involve three movies. That's going to be the next thing right after this. And then we're going to talk about a uh, franchise over the over four videos and with a movie club in between that. And then uh, that'll be October. And so uh, and then there'll be an Emily Blunt video at the start of November for Pain Hustlers. And then somebody else gets to take over finally. So uh, I'm very much looking forward to that. So uh, until the next thing, I think that's it.